Welcome to your class in Cognitive Psychology. I am your teacher John Mark Nadag, but you can call me Sir Mark. Our lesson for today is all about Introduction and History of Cognitive Psychology. Have you ever wondered how does memory work? And how do we perceive and understand our environment? How do we reason out? And how do we solve problems? How do we think? All of this is just part of cognitive psychology. Let's define first what is psychology. It is the study of how people perceive, learn, remember, and think about information. It involves mental process. Cognitive psychology is a branch of psychology that explores the operation of mental process related to perceiving, attending, thinking, language, and memory, mainly through inferences from behavior. In here, we have availability heuristics. This is a cognitive shortcut that occurs when we make judgments on the basis of how easily we can call to mind what we perceive as relevant instances of a phenomenon. For example, if we are repetitively exposed in an advertisement of Apple company regarding their product iPhone, we tend to familiarize all the informations regarding the advertisement. And if there's a time when you go to mall to buy a phone for your online class, the available information will pop in your mind. You will catch immediately the advertisement regarding iPhone. And in general, we have heuristic, the mental shortcuts we use to come to mind. This is also known as rule of the thumb. But why do we need to study cognitive psychology and its history? First, so that we may know where we came from. We may have a better understanding of what we are heading. Second, we can learn from past mistakes. And lastly, we will learn how people think by studying how people have thoughts about thinking and for progression of ideas. It involves dialectic. It is a developmental process where ideas evolve over time through a pattern of transformation. From your own common sense, a formal logic to understanding, an illumination and analysis, to synthesis and remediation, that is your reason, to practice until you reach practical wisdom. To further that, we have a thesis is proposed, wherein a thesis is a statement of belief. For antithesis emerge, this is a statement that counters a previous statement of belief. And with that, sooner or later, the debate between the thesis and antithesis leads to a synthesis. Philosophy. It seeks to understand the general nature of many aspects of the world in part through introspection. It is the examination of inner ideas and experiences. While the field of physiology, it seeks a scientific study of life-sustaining functions in living matter, primarily through empirical methods, that is, an observation-based methods. Plato, a rationalist who believes that the root to knowledge is true thinking and logical analysis. A rationalist does not need and experiments to develop new knowledge. In contrast, Aristotle was an empiricist. An empiricist believes that we acquire knowledge via empirical evidence. That is, we obtain evidence through experience and observation. Therefore, experiment is needed. John Locke Empirical Observation He believed that humans are born without knowledge and therefore, one must seek knowledge through empirical observation. He is known for his tabula rasa. It means to say, a blank slate. We need a bundle of experiences to put in a blank slate in order for us to gain self-perception. Immanuel Kant, who dialectically synthesized the views of Descartes and Locke, 
arguing that both rationalism and empiricism have their place, that both must work together in the quest for truth. Most 21st century psychologists today accept Kant's synthesis. Wilhelm Wundt, Father of Structuralism It seeks to understand the structure, configuration of elements of the mind and its perception by analyzing those perceptions into their constituent components such as affection, attention, memory, sensation, and etc. Let's have a review and here is a table summary. William James, Functionalism. It seeks to understand what people do and why they do it. John Dewey, a pragmatist who believed that knowledge is validated by its usefulness, what can you do with it? They want to know what we can do with our knowledge of what people do. Hermann Ebbinghaus, Associationism. It examines how elements of the mind, like events or ideas, can become associated with one another in the mind to result in a form of learning. Edward Lee Thorndike, Law of Effect He believed that an organism learns to respond in a given way, the effect, in a given situation, if it is rewarded repeatedly for doing so. The satisfaction which serves as stimulus to future actions. John B. Watson, father of radical behaviorism. It focuses only on the relation between observable behavior and environmental events or stimuli. Ivan Pavlov, a behaviorist. He is known to his classical conditioning in which a response is drawn out of the organism by a specific identifiable stimulus. Let's take a look for this example. In here, the unconditioned stimulus is the sight or smell of the food itself, and the unconditioned response is the dog's natural salivation in response to seeing or smelling their food. For the conditioned stimulus, the ringing of a bell which previously had no association of the food. The conditioned response is the salivation of the dog in response to the ringing of the bell even without the presence of the food. Another example is the Little Albert experiment. In here, the unconditioned stimulus is banging of a hammer on a metal bar and the unconditioned response is Little Albert cried because of the noise, the bang of hammer on a metal bar. And for the conditioned stimulus, it's the seeing and touching of the rat. For the conditioned response, is that Albert manifested fear of rats. Ulrich Neiser, he is known for his great contribution of the very first book of cognitive psychology on 1967. Research methods in cognitive psychology includes laboratory or other controlled experiments, neuroscientific research, self-reports, case studies, naturalistic observation, and computer simulations and artificial intelligence. Cognitive psychologists use various methods to explore how humans think. Fundamental ideas in cognitive psychology. First, empirical data and theories are both important. Second, cognition is generally adaptive but not in all specific instances. Third, cognitive processes interact with each other and with non-cognitive processes. Fourth, cognition needs to be studied through a variety of scientific methods. Lastly, all basic research in cognitive psychology may lead to applications and all applied research may lead to basic understandings. Thank you for listening and God bless.